We're going to try to stay on time uh, today. We're going long to the evening, so we want to make sure we stay on time for all of these panels. And th this in particular being our uh, student-led and uh, student-organized day, I'm just really excited about the response we've gotten to the work that our students are doing and proud to introduce you to all of them. Our next panel is called the Global Affirmative Action Praxis Project. And um, I think everybody on the panel, except for Camila, is fresh back from Brazil, but she's from Brazil, so I'm sure she's missing it. And uh, we hear all about, um, about her insights as well. I'm extraordinarily delighted and honored to have this opportunity to introduce you to this project. The students who you're about to hear represent the cutting edge of a growing interest in facilitating global dialogue about the conditions of racial subordination and the strategies for knowing, theorizing, and transforming racially stratified societies. As has been the case historically around the world, student initiatives have driven demands for racial justice in new, surprising, and transformative directions. The histories of social struggle for greater inclusion, equality, and freedom are frequently punctuated with the successful interventions of students. We need only mention the freedom rights Soweto, Tiananmen Square, the student strike in the 1960s in Paris. Students brought a new urgency and global attention to domestic concerns of inequality in these ways. In today's world, student interventions operate in a new world moment where globalization and interconnectedness are the touchstones for business, power, and authority. It is thus no accident that student initiatives seek to build bridges across national contexts to ensure that if power is global, so indeed should resistance. One of the key recognitions is that collectivizing knowledge and strategy is key to building capacities for greater inclusion and social justice. Set within this understanding, the Global Affirmative Action Praxis Project is an expression of this sensibility located specifically within the parameters of CRT in general and within law and public policy more broadly. A word about the specific genealogy of this project is in order, in part to highlight the important role of student agency in making this project possibility. This discussion began essentially on a lark when Professor Kim Crenshaw, who is a founder of our program and teaches in the program, announced to her civil rights class that she was going to accept the Fulbright Distinguished Chair for Latin America in the following, in the following year, to which some of the critical legal eagles suggested that would, it would be great to establish a field trip while she was there. <laughs> Somewhat whimsically, uh, they brainstormed about ways that they could make this happen. And having brainstormed so many projects uh, before that didn't materialize, she was actually surprised and delighted that the Critical Legal Eagles followed up the conversation with ideas, strategies for raising resources, and eventually a clear, well-thought-out proposal that won institutional support across UCLA. Now, for those of you who think that this trip was a boondoggle with a few meetings thrown in, let us be clear about what each student has contributed to making it possible. First. They created an intensive uh, semester-long seminar on affirmative action in five different countries, which Nashan referenced in the last uh, presentation. With the goal of gaining moderate fluency in the affirmative action discourse in each of these countries, the students then developed a specific comparative project animated by a hypothesis about the comparative value of lining up patterns of social inequality, dominant ideology, and remedial intervention. As you will hear on this panel, this produced a range of projects. Subsequently, the students organized their various papers into a coherent whole along with several proposed conversations and investigations relating to Brazil and the US. This intensive period of preparation was only a drop in the bucket in comparison to their work in Brazil. All in all, the team met with nearly 20 organizations and individuals, interacted with a range of students and activists at two mass meetings. They worked from morning and well into the night, even on weekends. And of course, upon their return, they've all worked pretty tirelessly to prepare for this panel and to create a website where the public can learn more about the project and about their proposals for further collaboration. As I'm sure each student will testify, this is not a project for the vacation-oriented. 
Uh, at the end of the panel, we want to um, take a moment of to, to uh, express some gratitude for the folks who made the project ha uh, happen in Brazil, and specifically to thank the specific uh, informants and fo folks who were involved in the project. So I'll let the panel start, and then we'll make sure to do that when we end. Thank you. So uh, believe it or not, these people did not party in Brazil. and. Um, I am very proud to be here today sharing this panel with my classmates and friends, and I thank you all for being here. My name is Camila, I'm an LLM student here in uh, UCLA, and I'm from Brazil. I was so excited to know that there was um, uh, a, a strong interest in my country and in this particular school. But more than that, I was very excited to know that there was a CRT, a CRS program in this school. I will start this conversation telling you about my own experience as a law student in my country. Well, we had two semesters of human rights, and they were mandatory. And I had one full semester studying individual liberties and also social and economic rights, which are established by our Constitution, Articles 5 and 7. I've never heard about the word race and I've never heard the word racism in these three semesters. This is not part of the discussion. This is not part of legal training. This is not part of the academic discussion. So when I came to this institution and I see what was happening, I thought to myself, well, Brazil is a large country. There are, you can debate the, the actual numbers, but there is 50% of the population blacks and, and pardos mixed. The pardos would be the, the, the browns. And uh, I thought to myself, it's impossible. We have such a progressive constitution. We must have laws and policies and regulations. And then I, from here, UCLA, I went to the computer and started researching. I knew a few of the policies, the more prominent ones, but not all of them. We have tons of policies, tons of regulations trying to help and materially advance the situation of the black folk in Brazil. Yet, me as a, law, as a lawyer in Brazil, I had never heard of them. And many lawyers that are now trying to work on the ground, they don't know how to operate them. This brings lots of questions to the plate. And the first is, how can we compare the situation with the US? The Global Affirmative Action Praxis Project is a window to dialogue. It's a place, it's a playing field to, to start to talk to Brazilian folks, and Brazilian folks talk to American folks of what can be comparable and why in the 1964 we had this grassroots movement, this from below constructed movement to advance policies and Professor um, Luke Harris was telling me we had other things going on from 64 in se uh, to 72 in the urban spectrum and why we had that here and then we had policies and why in Brazil we have policies but we don't have movement. Or now we have movement maybe, it's st it's starting. we are starting to have movement. But how that movement plays with the policy level, we don't know. And then I wanna say something else. More than advocacy, folks in Brazil and here, we wanna bring the discussion to this level. We wanna bring the discussion to an epistemic level not only to an advocacy. We don't want to be just a transnational advocacy group. We want to be an epistemic group, a group that can uh, discuss across disciplines, but also across countries. And I think this is very important. We start these windows to open these windows of dialogues, like the Global Affirmative Action Pro uh, Project, like the CRS studies here in UCLA, with things that are happening in Brazil. Brazilians have a lot to say to Americans, and Americans have a lot to say to Brazilians, especially because the policy outcome that we are looking at, they're very similar. Perhaps the cultural situation is different, perhaps the historically uh, constructed reality is different, but bottom line, Brazilians and Americans, we want to materially <coughs> advance the situation of blacks, and we also want to have a society that is more racially equal. So why not talk? Why not 
conf have these avenues established. I want to just say a, f uh, a final message. As a Brazilian here in UCLA, I don't see that there is an imperialist movement on this talk, that there is a top to bottom, that Americans are trying to import, that Brazilians are importing a problem from the U.S. And, and that's why they say, oh my goodness, here in Brazil we are racially harmonious. Oh yeah, baby. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But uh, in the U.S. you have this divided society. And I was talking to Professor Crenshaw, while black people are cleaning the bathrooms of my house, I want them to bring the fight. And I think the fight is worth the while. So with having said that, I pass the word to Nashan, my classmate. Okay. Have a few housekeeping issues in regards since we are a global project. We do we're accepting questions from the internet that are watching. The, you can email us at praxisproject at gmail dot com. P R X I S. My laptop thing went off. Thank you. Okay. All right. So Praxis Project, as well as you can find our blog spot, as well as. Um, if you're on Skype, a very great program, you could also Skype me at IceColdJD1906 and we'll be, accepting, we'll be accepting your questions there just for our global, and we also follow up Portuguese um, for our global audience. Me, me, a poco, follow Portuguese, but we, she knows a lot of it, so that's a, to make sure we get our language barrier broken. Um, I'm going to actually, my project was a, actually Brazilian access to higher education, it was a concern of mine as I spoke at an earlier panel, how, how are government and how is the law responding to education attainment of African people? And so this project, um, myself as well as Nikki actually took on the endeavor to actually think about a little bit more about Brazilian access to higher education. So what I'm actually going to focus on today at this panel is actually go through what is Brazilian higher education and what are some of the obstacles and barriers that pe uh, people face uh, to achieve a quality education. Um, the goal of our projects when I went down there was something to think about. How is the implement, implementation of affirmative action in higher education, the efficacy of this project to address educational inequality, and also to find out information about how the students are affected by affirmative action. So what I will be talking about is the structure, affirmative action, the vestibular, meritocracy, and white privilege, and Nikki will Con uh, do a lot more uh, discussion about affirmative action in the student experience. Um, a little bit of information that I learned within the first few days in Brazil is sh higher education is completely different in which the United States, the most prestigious universities are, are typically private. But in Brazil, they're public. They're free of charge. There are two types of public universities, state and federal. The most prestigious is the federal university. Private universities have a different space in Brazil, and that's something to make sure you always understand when doing a comparative, to find out what is this difference and how does this difference plays out. And there cur currently there's an increased production of private schools, but there are not a few, there's a small amount that are highly regarded. One of the few, high, one of the few highly regarded private schools are Puki Rio and Puki Sao Paulo, and we'll t have a look at what does that university look like. So Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. This university is uh, between the airport and the hills before you go directly into the city. But what's interesting enough when you go drive to this place is that on the left, left side of the highway you see the favelas, a slum of Brazil. But then you look toward the right, towards the ocean side, you actually see this beautiful campus. And as you can see by the pictures, this is what at, what's at stake when someone says a federal university in Brazil. The State University, another highly regarded because it's free and receives a lot of support, is Rio de Janeiro. As you can tell, the campus is actually not as beautiful as the Federal University. However, it's still regarded as a great university. The university that our professor, Professor Crenshaw is at, Pontifica Universidade Catolica uh, in Rio, I'm working on Portuguese, so, uh, uh, other known as Puki, Rio. And as you can tell, it's a very nice campus, but this is one of the unique spaces of private schools. As you can tell on the bottom of the screen, you have this 
a very fancy uh, whiteboard where it's electronic and it should let you understand what type of money is being invested into these seats when you think of like what is being denied. And Uni Paul Mars is actually a new space is that we went to find out uh, went to find the first black college in Brazil. And it was started in 2002 and you can find more information on our blog spot about the background. But as you can see, it's a brand new uh, school. They've moved into a th things. You can see some of the facilities in the back. But there's something a bit a, a problem about this. And this is the vestibular meritocracy and white privilege. In Brazil, universities are, admit students based on one exam, the vestibular. The vestibular is a two-day exam covering over eight pr topics. And each university has a different vestibular. So think about that challenge at the SAT. You'll have one exam, and it goes across a lot of different places. But you imagine you want to go to school in Brazil, you have to take very different vestibulars. And this test is taken a year after high school graduation. So a year off, you spend that time preparing for this hard exam. And one student actually told us that she attended a university, uh, high school in the States and that, that did not prepare her adequately to even achieve a prestigious spot into one of the universities. And that shows you how competitive it is to enter the university. In when you score on it, you have 200 spots and there's about 5,000 people. They t select the top person on that score, 1 through 200. And those are how it goes. There's nothing about that. So think about this. Well, how does one prepare for this test? Do you, how do you, in the United States, you think of just going to a good school. But in Brazil, it's more than just going to a good school. It's going to a private school and taking an expensive prep course. This prep course in the private schools have a direct correlation into the vestibular because some of the same people that grade the vestibular are the same people running the exams as well as providing the private schools. They're the same teachers and they're only the people that decide the scores are actually the people of the school. So at UFRJ is actually, they have their faculty and they select only a certain amount of uh, people that could actually grade this exam. The exam is also discursive, so it's no multiple choice. You sound like a great thing, but when you see actually the exam, it's like about this, this much writing space for maybe five or six math problems and you have to write out your problem. And it's a timed exam, so it lets you know this is a very bit hard test. And some of the barriers to attend, to think about this, minimum wage in um, Brazil is 300 Hays, which is equivalent to about $150. So how do you pay for a $1,000 prep course? <laughs> and so what do the pr current public schools do? Well, they have produced a functional illiteracy rate of 60%, oh, above 60%. I did not have the direct numbers, but think about that problem in a state, in a country where 54% of the population is African descended and they are in their below po below, at, in abject poverty, and this is what they receive. So how does one get into one of these universities? And while we were there, a part of our trip, we got a chance to hear a story of a grassroots organizer who prepared students for the vestibular. This was a thing she started about 20 years ago. 20 years ago. And she said she spent a lot of time and effort with teachers, scholars, preparing these students. And what was the result? A lot of them were able to enter private schools, but they weren't being able to enter the federal university. And what she wanted to tell us is that that showed that this test that they thought about wasn't just about merit or your understanding of knowledge, but it's actually a cultural, there's something more. And that something more is that you can't just say, oh, we prepared them because they're great students, they're able to go to other universities and perform, but there's something wrong about this test. And that, that's something I want to take back when thinking about the university in Brazil and the uh, structure of higher education is there's something wrong but with the vestibular. And as a response to affirmative action, as you can tell by this picture, it says vestibular and bronco, which is actually a, making mockery of the affirmative action, dis implementation of affirmative action in Brazil. And as you can tell, um, it's a black person, a mockery of a black person, a black Brazilian, in discussing that. But the institutional responses to affirmative action is completely different. As I mentioned earlier about the Federal University of Rio, they do not allow for affirmative action. In fact, that concern of affirmative action is a slow pro progress. 
the director actually informed us that the best possible way is actually the federal government to actually is the, is the only way for actually a space to actually implement affirmative action because for the university to make that change it's very conservative and they don't like change but there's another school the university the state university which has implemented affirmative action and in that space it's been very productive in fact a large amount of people that have never seen the university are now entering. But there's an interesting response to this. White students are now decided not to go to this prestigious university, one of the most highly regarded universities. And they'll choose to go to other schools, other private schools that are even less regarded because of their concern that the school and the quality of work is going down just by the admittance of the people. And even at our own wonderful Pookie where they're at the cutting age, and Nikki will talk a little bit more probably about the communitarian, you can find them more about our blogs. Even they have time. Students have told us that the responses of bathroom say we need to get rid of these black people or in a better terms. And those are things to think about in the, the structure of higher education, about what's really at risk in Brazil. And some of the things you want to think about is what about the black college? How does this fit in there? The black college was 2% is a response to increase educational access for Brazilians in the state where, in the country where only 2% of the undergraduate population is African descent. So that's my time, and I went over. But I had to go over the things so you can contextualize the comments that were a part of that. So that's it. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, hello. Uh, hopefully, what Tajay folks are watching in Brazil. I uh, hope somebody is. Um, my name is Nikki, um, and I am generally interested, like Nishan, in education, affirmative action in higher education, and just how exactly the terms of the culture, the politics, the legal maneuverings are used to grant or deny access to higher education. So I went to Brazil with three major research questions. The first is, you know, just what is the nature and, and the, the, the effectiveness of the backlash against affirmative action in Brazil? Second. Um, how are the arguments framed, the arguments for and arguments against affirmative action? Or what sort of discourse is forming around these issues? And three, what, if any, effect does that backlash have on student beneficiaries of affirmative action? And, and what's the reaction? What are students doing about it? So for the sake of <coughs> eight minutes, I'm going to focus on that question number three um, and talk a little bit about the backlash with respect to how students that we've had a chance to interact with are responding to it, characterizing it and moving on from it. Um, I should back up a little bit just to say there is indeed backlash. I think when we first engaged in this process, um, not all of us were, sh were sure that we would find such backlash, but that, that last picture, that pretty horrible caricature, was just up because it was in a newspaper that, you know, somebody decided to, to draw this character, caricature of a, an, an Afro-descendentia, a person of, Brazilian, of African descent in Brazil. Um, and this is in a nation that, you know, for a long time has sort of touted racial democracy. We all sort of have this equal stake in, you know, our full citizenshiphood and our, you know, our cultureship. And so that's the sort of thing that some students are dealing with. Um, a few things have happened already in the few short years that there's been affirmative action, both policies and in the state of Rio de Janeiro, a law requiring affirmative action in its public universities. Um, there have been court cases similar to the ones, the litigation that we've seen in front of our Supreme Court, seeking to declare the affirmative action policies unconstitutional under the Brazilian Constitution. Um, there are just sort of general attitudes that you see out there on newspapers or written on the walls. We've been told that, you know, things like we have to get rid of these black people is written on, you know, the walls of one of the institutions that we visited. Um, faculty attitudes. Um, I was surprised that they had, we have a similar experience with faculty attitudes. Those of you who attend UCLA know that we have um, some vocal faculty with attitudes about whether or not we belong here at UCLA. And I actually did learn that we have, that students in Brazil have similar experiences with, you know, the faculty that are teaching them signing petitions to do away with the policies that are giving them the opportunity to have full access to education. Um, and another thing is, you know, student attitudes, which we talked a little bit about. So just. As a student, I've been a student probably too long now, um, and so it's given me the opportunity to observe, you know, from a pre-affirmative action environment to a post-affirmative action environment. So I've been to a little private school, a big public school, and now a, a huge public school with no, with no affirmative action at all. 
Um, and I would like to say with no backlash, but you know, we're still being questioned on a regular basis. <laughs> Um, and so what I've also observed about students is that, you know, there, there are students who sort of just suffer this, like, you know, we have to get through it, you know, put your head down and, and let's survive this experience and that's the end of it. Um, there are, of course, those, those folks and there's, you know, similar students who decide that, you know, my goal is to stay under the radar, get my degree and, and get out of here. Um, so I kind of went to Brazil with that baseline and wondering if I would, you know, meet some similar, um, attitudes, experiences, responses. We did meet a few people who, who didn't really perceive themselves as having been received well by their institutions, but at the same time didn't perceive that experience as racialized. So in some conversations I spoke to students and asked, you know, well, how have you been received? And some of the responses were, you know, because race and class track each other so closely um, in a country that's so overwhelmingly black, the black are overwhelmingly the people who constitute the poor, as a lot of the response was, well, you know, I'll have money for fancy dresses and I'll have money to participate in the things that my classmates participate in. So a lot of the alienation that people experience, they articulate it as class. Um, and so there's a number of questions that sort of arise out of that. You know, one, to a certain extent, that's got to be true. And two, to a certain extent, we sort of wonder what does that mean in terms of interpreting your own experience when the backdrop is that we're you know, part of a racial democracy? Um, we also ex interpreted, reached some, some students who um, found themselves sort of pressed to overcome this merit. I remember being a little kid and my mom would tell me, you know what, you have to work twice as hard to get half as far. And that was it. There wasn't any do your best. It was you need to do better than all the white kids if you expect to get anything. And I you know, had kind of a bonding moment with another student, um, Isis, who is um, a lawyer. She's a recent, recent graduate and also teaches um, at university and volunteer teaches at Educafro. And her, you know, she was taught the same thing. She was like, you know, this is not going to be easy. It's like you have to go out every day and kill a lion if you want to accom accomplish this. <laughs> and if you're black, you've got to kill two. <laughs> <laughs> so this sort of like overperforming coping strategy is one that I felt like also was a shared experience that people felt like in order to, you know, justify my presence here, I need to overperform. I need to, you know, know what I'm talking about when I speak up. I need to be able to recite the rule against perpetuities. I need to know, you know, I can't Logic. think out loud. And I, that was a real shared thing. Um, and it's, there's sort of another set of reactions that I think mirror ones that I experienced in my, in my context. And that is, you know, questioning the underlying assumptions, like questioning what constitutes merit, what constitutes a measure of it, you know, what constitutes a fair measure of it. Is the, is the playing field really level? Like, what's the status quo? Where are we starting from? Because a lot of this, you know, back and forth about affirmative action really does sort of presume the, the, the equal footing to start and the fairness in, evalu in evaluation. So we met a lot of students who found ways to question the ba baseline. Um, Helen is one student who is at UERJ, the State University of Rio de Janeiro that Nishan talked about. She's um, one of the first students, she will be one of the first students to graduate under you know, uh, Rio de Janeiro's new laws, new quota laws. Um, these students are being called um, for what it's worth quotistas. I'm not sure how to interpret that as, you know, welcomed or not, but I hear them use it as well. Um, and one of the things that's really important for her is really stressing the idea that she's now engaged in a university where knowledge is produced. So focusing on the important that this is where knowledge, knowledge production happens. And she said to us in, in a small meeting that, you know, what's our point in being here if we're not questioning what knowledge is being produced and how it's being produced? Um, another student, Lu Luinda, similarly, you know, stressed that idea. Um, Helen actually is on a a committee to reevaluate the effectiveness of affirmative action. And of course that committee, that commission has been asking like how many students, how many came, how many left, how many are still here, how many are financial aid, how many lost scholarships. But what she's kind of pushing them to ask is how are you receiving us? What are you teaching us? Are you teaching our history? Are you giving us enough information? Is there enough, you know, social acceptance here? Are we being treated like people who truly belong? Um, so those things all sort of were, you know, resounded back and forth, but, you know, what of it now? Um, what do we do with that? One thing that I heard a lot when I was there, and all different, you know, from people who were against and in favor of affirmative action was, you know, look at um, the, the students, they're doing as well as or better than anybody else. 
You know, so yeah, affirmative action. And at first I felt good about that. I felt good about hearing that. It felt good to hear that, you know, students, despite these odds, are doing so well. But, you know, there's something troubling under that that we need to think about when we take away. Um, and that is, you know, why do we have to kill two lions? And what does it mean to have to come from an environment where we're being produced as 60% functionally illiterate, more likely to live in segregated housing, more likely to die early, more likely to be a subject to police violence, less likely to have money to pay for any of these tests if you can pa pass them and get approved, um, and still have to kill two lions. So, you know, as much as I sort of celebrate the success of the students that I met, um, I think that together we are, you know, really questioning the, the validity of that sort of assertion that that's the reason why affirmative action is necessary. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting to take away is that we have real similar experience with backlash, uh, which surprised me um, in one way and another way it doesn't. So here we are in this post-209 post environment where you would think, you know, no affirmative action, no backlash, nobody's going to stop us and ask us who we are. If we go to office hours, we're not going to get asked what's wrong, what don't you know, as opposed to what do you want to talk about. But we are. We're facing it. You know, our professors, professors who teach 1Ls are, you know, deciding during the week of finals to host a talk to, to explain why we don't belong here. Um, it, and it, it, what it says to me is that there's something under the surface, that if this really is a post-affirmative action environment and we still have backlash, there's something more being exposed about attitudes towards race, racism and what the status quo ought to be. Similarly, from our observations in Brazil, you know, if we're really supposed to be a part of this racial democracy, um, and students are showing up and doing well, and they're still being, you know, we gotta get rid of these black students. And faculty are still petitioning to get rid of them. And the attitudes are still, you know, that, you know, we need to leave a free, highly prestigious university because it's getting more populated by blacks. It again suggests that there's something else at play. Um, racial democracy is, you know, sort of, in front of a whole nother set of racial attitudes that are becoming clear. Um, my sort of hypothesis taking away, and I'll close, is that you know the future of affirmative action in, in both U.S. and Brazil may really lie in the ability of, our, of us as supporters and activists to challenge these concepts of merit, to challenge our responsibility to kill two lions, and to challenge the sort of veils that are used to equalize, to naturalize the, the status quo. Okay, so I'm gonna make an attempt to be brief. Um, so uh, I started, I guess, my project with an observation in the United States, and then I wanted to find out whether or not that sort of phenomenon exists in Brazil, and then I wanted to know what sort of effect it had in Brazil. So first, my observation in the United States. Observation is an obvious one. The relationship between blacks and the police is a tenuous one. <laughs> um, and I'm saying that to be facetious, right? Blacks are victims of unjustifiable harassment in the United States, physical violence, and sometimes accidental death, like in the example of Sean Bell. Uh, and this uh, affects loyalty to the United States within black communities, uh, their feeling of safety in the United States, and even legitimacy of the state, okay? So I'm interested in whether or not that sort of phenomenon exists in Brazil, considering this ideology that persists of racial democracy. So what is racial democracy? Let me give you a brief discussion of what racial democracy is. It's the belief that because there is some sort of a social unity in Brazil, that racial equity exists, all right? So because I hang out with black people and they're my close friends and maybe I have a black uncle or cousin, Racism doesn't exist in, in my country, basically. Okay, so that's, that's the cliff notes of racial democracy. Okay, so um, I'm interested in finding out whether or not there is a similar sort of tenuous relationship. So that's the first thing that I'm interested in. The second thing I'm interested in is the relationship that it has on black movements in, the Uni in Brazil. Okay, so uh, in the United States, um, Police violence is very, very important with regard to black movements um, and with regard to racial discourse, period. So uh, police violence against the black body has often been the most powerful motivation 
toward struggles for racial equality. So take, for instance, the images of Bull Connor and his minions spraying black children trying to integrate schools, right? Um, that image was a powerful motivating factor for both blacks and whites during the civil rights movement, right? Um, if that image didn't shoot into the, the kitchen tables or, or shoot into the televisions over dinner, who knows what would have happened in the civil rights movement. Some people argue that that image is just as powerful as the image of the March on Washington and, you know, the I Have a Dream speech, right? So, even in contemporary times, discourse on race very, very similar. It, it, you know, nothing uh, ha sparks more fervent and open debate about race than, you know, police violence against black bodies, whether it be Rodney King, whether it be Amadou Diallo, whether it be uh, racial profiling and harassment. This is, this is where we talk openly about race, typically. So I'm interested in, in figuring out whether or not, I'm interested in observing, or I was interested in observing whether or not a similar sort of phenomenon occurs in, in Brazil. Okay, so um, I got a, a very interesting observation. So uh, on a sunny day in Sao Paulo, um, on my way to uh, one of our various meetings, we did 13-hour days typically, uh, <laughs> I was in a, in a taxi with Nishan, and uh, Nishan and I were in the back seat, Melissa was in the uh, front seat and the taxi driver was obviously driving, clearly marked taxi. Um, we're having a, a good time trying to stay woke, you know, very, very tired. But you know, generally in good spirits and then like a shadow comes over the car. And I'm sitting in the passenger, oh, I'm sitting in the passenger back seat and I look over and I see the barrel of a rifle. Um, so I begin looking, you know, first, first thing I'm thinking is this, is this is really, really scary. And so I begin noticing other things, right? I notice a black car, I notice lights, and I notice a shield on the car. It's the police, okay? So at this point, I'm, I'm you know, scared to death because I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, and I don't make any sudden movements because I don't want them to take any sort of implications about exactly what I'm doing. Um, and they follow us for about a block and a half, and then they roll off. Now. You know, the first thing I want to say is, you know, just from an emotional level, right, I've been stopped by the police a lot. I grew up in the late 80s and early 90s in Los Angeles. I like to listen to hip-hop music. I wear my hat backwards. Um, I get pulled over two, three times a year probably. Um, but this didn't feel like a police stop. This felt like gang intimidation. You know, this is the feeling that you get when you, the whole drive-by story, right? Someone rolls on you, flicks off the lights, asks you where you're from. That's what this felt like. <laughs> okay, so I'm scared to death. Um, I, uh, so, you know, we, we, we get to our, our, our presentation, or we get to our, our, our meeting, and uh, we, you know, we, we relay this story to Professor Crenshaw, and, you know, we, we're trying to figure out exactly what's going on. And one of the things that's very, very interesting is that everyone says, well, not everyone, but a lot of the, the movement leaders who we talk to, and even some of the people who aren't movement leaders, says this is a normal occurrence in Brazil. As a matter of fact, many of them argued that it wasn't even uh, 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 it wasn't even as controversial, right? We weren't pulled out of the car, we weren't arrested, we weren't beaten, um, and it's normal. The universal story was that you were in the car with a white woman, and we're like, who's the white woman? Melissa was the white woman, go figure. And um, we were kidnapping her, right? The fear was that we were kidnapping her, right? Um, and so I, I, was, I was interested, I mean, I guess that was the most pertinent example of exactly getting the answer that I was looking for, right? You know, whether or not this sort of uh, racial policing exists in Brazil. Well, the answer is yes, I lived it. Um, it's funny. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to figure out exactly, you know, well, what sort of what sort of impact does this have on black movement? So I talked to some of the leaders and I wanted to know exactly, well, exactly what's going on. You know, you guys have you know, organized nonprofit organizations, you guys have grassroots organizations, exactly how you were responding to this. And, you know, I got a, a variety of responses, but, you know, one of the ones, two, 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 two that I'd like to, you know, kind of address is first is the perceived, uh, addressing the perceived increase of violence in Brazil, right? So there's this fear that crime is on the rise, therefore there needs to be more policing. Now the movement has to negotiate success in legislation 
and keeping some sort of political legitimacy while at the same time not sounding too unpopular asking for you know a more holistic or safe or racially conscious form of policing. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that they talked about is the the long shadow of the military regime, right? So we we must remember that Brazil is a relatively new democracy, recently free, uh, recently democratic, and so the military still casts a very, very long shadow. So people are interested in, um, in, in, in you know, maintaining legit political legitimacy and holding on to the successful legislation that they've occurred, you know, that, that has occurred. Um, you know, I could talk about, no, I'm going to end there. Um, yeah, so I, I have some specific suggestions, but maybe those will come out in, in um, question and answer. I want to relay my time for, for the next person. Thank you. I just want to make a real brief uh, comment on racial democracy. I want to say that the idea of racial democracy came in the 30s with a very famous work called The Masters and the Slaves uh, by Gilberto Freire. And it's based on the mestizo culture. In Brazil, many people believe we, we are a mestizo society. But our constitution embraces the idea of plurality. We are ethnic and racially uh, plural. So there is this conflict, again, between policies and between what our cultural understanding and our cultural national ideology stands for. Okay, so I'm going to tell my, the, the story of our police encounter from, from my perspective. But first I should begin by saying that in Brazil I knew I fell into the category of white, you know, because I don't look black, I don't look indigenous, so that kind of left me in the broader... Uh, Brazilian, you know, category of white. So I was also in the taxi and, you know, we were sitting, talking, laughing, and all of a sudden I noticed this big gum barrel, and he's not exaggerating, it was huge, and it was pointing right at our taxi, and so I was like, okay, you know, remain calm because you don't want them to stop you. So I looked over, I looked forward, and I thought to myself, I don't want to look at them because I know they're thinking that these two black, dangerous black men have kidnapped this white woman who's like helpless and, and they're going to stop us if I look at them. So I remained calm, I kept looking forward and two seconds later they were still there. So for like two blocks they were following us and the entire time I was, you know it was tense and I was thinking, you know, all they have to do is look over, they're going to see that I don't have a gun, that I'm not dangerous, that I'm just some woman in a taxi, and they're not going to do anything to me, right? So, you know, they drove off, and, and I was fine. George and Sean, on the other hand, were like in the back of the seat, and they were silent the entire time. They were petrified all the way to um, our next appointment. You know, and, and I just want to contrast that with, with, you know, my reaction as someone who was socially white in Brazil, all I had to worry about is them looking into my lap and knowing that as soon as they saw I wasn't dangerous, they were going to drive off. And I knew I wasn't going to die. I knew I wasn't going to get killed. I knew everything was just going to be fine and we were going to continue on. Them, on the other hand, you know, with a big gun pointed at them, I'm sure they thought, you know, the police are just waiting for an excuse to shoot us. It wasn't even a matter of being pulled over. I think they would have just probably shot. So, um... So that just kind of made me reflect on the racial democracy and how, as a white person in Brazil, you could grow up with this bubble of privilege and never really see what other racialized what black people experience, right? Because that, they're the most subordinated group in that society. Or if you do know that you're, that you're privileged, there's no reason for you to want to give up that privilege. There's no incentive. And then on the other hand, it makes it hard for people to want to identify as black because you know, you, you, know you, wanna, you have every reason not to identify as black, right? To identify as something other, which creates, you know, which creates a big challenge for, for the black movement. And um, Priscilla has more to say on that, so I'm going to let her tell about that. Thank you. I was going to be coming up that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> the story. Um, uh, my name is Priscilla Ochan. I'm a third year law student here at UCLA uh, with a graduating third year law student uh, in a couple weeks. May 11th. Excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the emphasis in critical race theory, and this, this trip has really been the highlight of our experience, of my experience uh, here at UCLA. And 
you have to forgive me. I, I think coming back from Brazil, I, I came down with the flu, and now I have uh, bronchitis or something like that. So uh, please forgive me if I'm speaking a little bit slow. And, and George, George hasn't been sick, so I'm saving up all of my sickness energy for him. And uh, coming back, one of the uh, mo most of us were sick. Most of us were sick. I think everyone, with the exception of George. And the thing that I thought was, this is racial. You know? <laughs> This is racial, you know, we went to Brazil to study racial discrimination and we're coming back to tell our story and they're trying, you know, we're being silenced, uh, you know, I've got this bronchial infection and that's just not right, you know. Um, and it's really interesting that I thought that, you know, joking to myself, this is racial, um, but it, it kind of leads nicely into the, the, the sort of comparative project that I went to Brazil to explore, which was, what it, how, how, do you, how do you facilitate movement building? You know, one of the things that Camilla mentioned is that Brazil is now exploring remedies in the absence of sort of a broad mass mobilization of people. Another thing that she mentioned was this myth of racial democracy, which said, you know, we don't have uh, any racial groups here in Brazil. We, we are a Brazilian people. Um, so there are no black people here. There are no brown people here. We are all Brazilian. So this negated the language of, of race, this negated the ability of people to racially identify to form communities. And one of the interesting things that I heard in Brazil um, as we were engaging in this comparative discourse with a number of people was that, you know, segregation might have been the best thing for black people in the U.S. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> Couple times. Uh, you know, and, and, I, and reflecting on that and reflecting on sort of my first notion of, you know, this is racial, um, segregation did have the function of creating ins black institutions, of creating black churches, creating black spaces and, uh, and, and black identities so that people could see themselves as a collective, such that when we experienced acts of police brutality or acts of discrimination, we were able to associate that with, an, uh, with a language, with, with, uh, we were able to see a structure of subordination, we were able to see what was happening to us, that it wasn't something that was wrong with us individually. And that's one of the interesting things that, we, that I heard uh, in speaking to people in Brazil is that in the absence of a group, being discriminated against is, is humiliating. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's something that you know nobody wants to experience. In the absence of having a group to to identify with, it's either it's it's not externalized. That experience of degradation, that experience of humiliation, is not ex externalized in terms of we we put that upon the society. It's put upon the individual. And one of the interesting one of the things I was interested in exploring is how how the movement in Brazil went about you know, viewing this issue of racial identity or collective identity, whether they thought it was necessary to resist the sort of mass oppression that faced black people in Brazil, even those people that wouldn't identify as black, that don't identify as black. So there are a number of cl color classifications, and only some of the people in Brazil who are discriminated against, who suffer because they are typed as, as black, you know, um, they don't necessarily identify that way. So the black movement, I was interested in exploring how they facilitated that groupness. You know, that in our movement, that wasn't, that was sort of a given in terms of the, the, the groupness that black folks had and that black, black folks experienced. You know, we experienced it in the church, we experienced it in the various businesses that were facilitate, that, that were created to serve the black community. We experienced that in social spaces, we experienced it in political spaces in terms of, you know, organizations that were, were uh, major in terms of the, the resistance, whether it was NAACP, SNCC, et cetera, black colleges. Um, so our racial identity, and, and also in terms of negative uh, interactions with the police, with, with uh, white supremacy, our, our, our race was always present and it was not an option. You could not opt out of our, we could not opt out of our blackness. Um, the opposite is the case in Brazil. And interestingly, in terms of our context, this, this, this collectivity that we experience, often people cite this as the reason why our movement has faltered, that we have lost this sense of connectivity. The black schools, the black businesses are no longer, black churches are no longer as vibrant as they once were during that period of segregation. And so 
as I said, I was interested in how this was being facilitated. And one of the major ways this is being facilitated in Brazil is through culture, this marriage of culture and politics, of politicizing blackness, of encouraging people to identify through building up sort of a black is beautiful aesthetic of African people, of African um, ideology, of African history. And as Nikki mentioned, there's now this um, law to teach black culture and black history in schools. Um, so I was interested in finding out more about that, and, and given that that wasn't a major part of our movement. And so in exploring that, I, I was also interested in some of the criticisms. There's, there's been some writing about the black movement in, in Brazil. It sort of developed in the, in the early 70s, and some of the writings, uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Hanschard wrote a book sort of critiquing um, culturalism. He felt that culturalism wasn't, wasn't political enough. It may have given people a sense of, uh, you know, feel feel goodness about themselves, but it didn't motivate action, it didn't motivate challenges to the um, total exclusion of people from education or from, you know, in terms of housing, in terms of other forms of sort of covert segregation. And so I was, I had that sort of observation, but then I also had a number of observations with people who I learned, you know, in terms of how, how do people communicate the, mo the, the messages of sort of the, 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 the black movement. How do you communicate that with the masses um, when you have a population that is over 60% illiterate, where you don't have the spaces as we do here, when the spaces that you do have are functionally cultural. You have um, things like samba schools, you have um, other spaces like that, which aren't explicitly political, but, but they're cultural. But those are the spaces that you have. So you know, how do you balance that? When you know that culture isn't as politicized as, as it as it might uh, be, but you also understand that those are the spaces that you have and those are the spaces that you can reach black people. And so come, looking, looking at those two sets of observations, I guess at the end of the day, uh, it's sort of like, um, you know, sort of the critiques of the church. People say, you know, religion is the opiate of the masses. It, it uh, pacifies people. Uh, the same thing can be said of, of culture that, you know, carnival and these various celebrations, they pacify people. They give people an outlet for their rage and their frustration about all of the, the discrimination they face, samba, et cetera. It gives, a, it gives people an outlet for all the rage that they face on a day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, year-to-year. -year. It gives, this, gives folks an outlet. But then you look at the black church in, in, uh, in the United States and that radical sort of theology and that way in which it reached people and motivated their action. I guess at the end of the day, in terms of my observations of you know, the limitations of communications, how, how, folks can, how folks identify and don't identify, um, I think that culture um, is one mechanism that the black movement has, but that the way in which it can be radicalized, I think, can facilitate further development of black identity, sort of a, you know, I, I, I know folks know about James Brown, and uh, I know a lot of people um, who said, you know, I, I wasn't really feeling being black, you know, I was still a Negro, you know, um, but when I heard that song, and when I heard that uh, as part of a soundtrack of a movement, it really motivated my action, it really motivated my connection to being radicalized as a black person. And so I think that culture does have a lot of possibilities in terms of facilitating mass mobilization and movement building. And so I'm sorry for rambling, but uh, um, thank you all very much for your time. Just a reminder for our webcast listeners, if you have any questions, you can cut or pregunt us um, on the screen behind me, and that's it. We're open for questions. Nadine. <laughs> okay, so uh, the first thing, the first question was whether or not we have uh, similar struggles. Now, I, I think that's a very interesting question because when I, I left, I was thinking that's going to be very, very different. But uh, when I arrived there um, and observed some of the similar situations that they're in, um, I felt like I had got on a plane, flew for 24 hours, and landed where I left. 
um, you know, walking on, for instance, Pookie's campus and, you know, seeing that it was, you know, a handful of black people and they are really close to each other. You know, sometimes the things that are said inside of class are very different from the things that are said outside of class. Um, and just really feeling a, an interesting connection with people. Um, it felt like they were... I, the perfect example that I like to give is um, uh, Paul Morris, when I went to Paul Morris. So, you know, this is the black college at, in, in Sao Paulo. And I walked in, I was looking around, and I was like, so this guy right here looks just like my brother. And this guy, this, this sister right here looks just like my aunt. And, and there was another guy who looked just like Earl Fari Hutchison. And so I was sitting in the room thinking, you know, I am not in the United States, but I feel like this is, like, th these are my people. So, I mean, um, I really felt much more at home than I thought I would. And just to, to add to that, I think, um, you know, two of the things that we were comparing uh, was, were the, the ideologies of racial democracy and colorblindness. And both of them say, you know, everybody's equal. You know, what are y'all talking about? You always talk about race. Stop tripping. You know, basically, you know, and um, you know, so that that was similar across the board. That there was a denial of race and racial inequality in in both Brazil and both in um, in in the U.S. But at the same time, there was a deep and profound commitment uh, and, and idea. And, ideological commitment to black inferiority, black <laughs> criminality, you know, um, black folks being at the bottom of society as if that's like naturally where we're supposed to be, sort of the naturalizing of, you know, black subordination. And one of the interesting conversations I had was on the first day was about, you know, we were talking about affirmative action and we were trying to facilitate a conversation with a number of students. And so we were like, you know, how, how is it being, you know, one of uh, um, you know, five black people at your school, and they're like, yeah, well, how is it being at your school? We're like, yeah, one of five black people. <laughs> you know, uh, same, same, you know. Um, and they were like, so, you know, so we asked, you know, what are the rationales, what are the arguments against affirmative action? You know, we're not smart, black people aren't, are lazy, black, you know, sort of the same, the same rationales for why black people are excluded from public spaces, from, you know, basically treated as second class citizens, motivate, you know, are, are present in both, both the Brazil and the U.S. So anything that we said, all we got was amens, basically we had an amen <laughs> chorus. And anything that they said, it was like, you know, uh, you know, feel like it's, is there an echo in here? You know, that, that's kind of what we felt, um, but at the same time, there were some interesting differences that you know maybe we'll talk about uh, a little bit uh, later in terms of how one of the things that, that I was that I was mentioning was sort of that black solidarity. We didn't I, I don't know how people felt about across the board. I felt I feel like we have to some degree a little more more race consciousness, which I think helps to. Um, helps to build more community even in these spaces that, that we have. Um, so I think that that's, that's an important difference in terms of how colorblindness and racial democracy have functioned in the U.S. and Brazil. I just want to add about the struggle, specifically um, answering this question. At the normative level, I think it's very similar, but materially speaking, the black people in Brazil are still far behind the black in the U.S. Uh, we don't have that, you, we don't have a black middle class. And if you see black people in Brazil are still really, really, really poor. And I think the advances that you have here are maybe derived from this solidarity. I'm not saying that there is not work, you know, more work to do. There is a lot of work to do and um, to, to better the material conditions. But in Brazil, we are starting now from zero and we have a lot, lot, lot to do.
exceptions where the flax excel whites economically. I mean, is there any place where this is actually been achieved? <laughs> 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 Uh, now, now. Now. <laughs> <laughs> now. Now. Not that I mean, I'm outside of Africa. Africa, I mean, you know, if we look at different African countries. If, if there is, we haven't observed it yet. Yeah. Uh, this is well above our uh, our an, our analysis. Uh, I I, we, I haven't seen it, uh, but I have limited knowledge. And maybe that's why the transnational work is, is so important because, you know, no one has achieved that yet. So let's get together and try to find a solution, please. <laughs> Questions? Questions? I mean, we sort of spoke to a, a breadth of students, um, and because of the nature of our project, I would actually say that I spoke to more students who perceive themselves as black and their experience is racialized, the content of their curriculum as being, you know, really, you know, Anglo for the most part. Um, so there was, a, there was a real sort of split, right? There's a, a number of students who think, well, my problems are economic. My problems are I don't have money, I don't have resources, I don't have connections. You know, and I think that that's generally true. And I think that for a number of the other students we met, you know, the, the addition to that was, and my problems are economic in large part because of the color of my skin. And the way I'm being treated is because I'm black. And, you know, for example, one of the, the students that we met, um, we didn't speak a whole lot of the same language. I spoke this much Portuguese and she spoke this much English, but when she stood up and spoke in one of our conferences on racism, she's a graduate student, doctoral student in history, and she's like, how am I supposed to be a doctoral student in history? How am I supposed to come away from here learning anything if I can't study my own history? There's no way. And so when I asked her later on, in my like, really broken Portuguese, I said, like, so how do you feel like they've received you? And her answer was one word, no. <laughs> now? <laughs> now? So it's not that, I just think we sort of have like, you know, different, you know, ways of having a black consciousness or a different people with different in different positions. But I think because of the nature of our studies, we met a lot of people who are real conscious of race. And I guess one of the so th there's a growing growing like uh, I guess generation of students, but they're facing you know, an interesting I guess challenge. So I remember this one story of this guy talking about how, you know, I'm trying to learn about what it means to be black and trying to teach it to others, but you know, my mom is like, you know, I'm a racist, and she tells me this all the time. I'm a racist because, you know, I'm trying to study my own history and and teach it to others, and you know, you know, and then you know, his response to us was, you know, whereas in your country, you know, you're taught about your history and you know, you're taught, and I'm like, well, you, you know, it's funny because, you know. It's not all altogether true. You know, you have to get a graduate degree in order to learn about your own history in, in many places in the United States, first of all. And second of all, a lot of the sort of experiences that you're having with regard to being conscious about yourself are stories that, you know, our parents had to deal with. So I told them the story about how when my mom decided to become, you know, a conscious person, she had to explain to, you know, my grandmother, who was a hardcore Republican, um, why exactly she was doing that. You know, and so it's not. It, you know, I think that there there's a growing generation of people who are who are who are uh, facing similar challenges. I think some small things are just sort of solutions that I imagine. I mean, a, a part of our work here is, you know, we want to be scholars, but we also want to be activists and, and, and make the way for the people behind us. So I think a few of the interventions that I met students engaging in, I, I really thought I want to import this. Um, for example, the Palm Palmares Global Language Institute, you know, one of the, the important things about having sort of international coalitions and international work is that we need to be able to speak to each other. And so there's a group of students 
that are using limited resources and time um, and making a point to learn global languages um, and speak to each other in them. So that's definitely a thing that I would hope that we would import. Um, as a critical race studies student, I would hope that maybe in the coming years, you know, that now that we are really globalized, yeah. globalized and interdisciplinary, that we'll begin to add language to our, to our context. Um, and the other thing I think is really, I think that to some extent we do it, but I, I heard young people, even undergrads doing it more, is seeing ourselves in a, pl in a place where knowledge is produced and seeing it as our fundamental role to question it. Oh, and one other thing that perhaps we could use here is that over there they, they're starting to make a lot of programs which focus specifically on black health. And th they do this at the federal and at the state level, which is something that we don't have here. And of course they have a lot of people, opponents, who say, well, how are we going to make a special program for black people? We're all black. We're all mixed to some degree. But people have been able to take advantage of uh, political moments. For instance, there was uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro had a black governor, Benedita da Silva. So when she was in power, um, a lot of the people you know, were able to make these programs actually happen. So that's an idea for here, too. I think it speaks a little bit to the idea that uh, Latin America as a whole is socially driven. Like our constitutions, they insert lots of social rights, not only political and uh, civil at the individual level. So this protection of collective uh, or diffuse rights, I think it's something that we could start talking more here in the U.S. Well, um, as far as I know, uh, there is a very, very, uh, maybe the largest community outside um, of Japan, for example, in Sao Paulo, in, in a place called Liberdade, which means freedom in Portuguese, and it's a very large community. Uh, I think the uh, interaction between groups, it's, it's not as difficult as in the U.S., I would guess, because of this idea of racial democracy. So socially, I think they, will, they would interact uh, pretty well, I would say. Uh, in terms of uh, census uh, data, they are, um, uh, all Asians are uh, categorized as yellow. Uh, that, that's the, the term used by our census. And unfortunately, in terms of the, uh, the affirmative action debate, we, we don't have this particular group inserted as much, even because I would say that Asians uh, still have excelled a little better or maybe more than a little in Brazil. Fortunately, the Asians are pretty successful. But uh, the Indians and Asians, they've been left out of the affirmative action, especially quotas debate. And that's something that we could start talking to. the affirmative action uh, policies that they have in Brazil, did they explicitly use race um, in, their, in their debates or did they avoid, avoid it as was done here uh, in the United States uh, recently with Michigan and to a lesser extent California? And also, what was the experience of black faculty at the universities that you went to or were there? Uh, yeah. It's a good That's assumption there. It's a preliminary one. There's one thing in the statement is not uh, affirmative action policies are not something that's always across the entire country. And that's one thing that's distinct. And that's why when we experience three different states, you have three different concerns. So in Rio de Janeiro, the concern is the states have impl states across the board in the educational context. Universities have started implementing affirmative action policies because the state laws are a little bit, a little bit more. People have a closer to the ground compared to the federal concern where they have the largest resistance concerns. And Camila also said there's a, oh, I'm not for sure there's a web yeah. resource that talks about. Uh, there is a, um, a chart on uh, different laws, different state laws or, or even administrative resolutions that establish quotas and the criteria for that. Some are class-based, some are mixed, some are race-based. And also uh, some include Indians, some not. It depends on the demographic of the state. And I could, you know, I could make this chart available if you wish. But to, to answer your question, um, from, from, our, from my understanding and I, I think from generally our reading 
um, the, the debate regarding affirmative action um, was explicitly racial, which was why it was so groundbreaking. Um, it came out a lot of, largely out of the, the, the World Conference on Racism, the UN um, World Conference on Racism, sort of opened up that space, which, which is why it's such an interesting space to, for comparison, because mm -hmm. now we're seeing the erosion of affirmative action here and the sort of opening of the discussion in Brazil, which is, I guess, the, the question that someone asked earlier was, you know, what, 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 what was the takeaway? What are we learning coming away from this? Is that it's really important for us to engage in these conversations, like Camila was mentioning, because there is so much to learn, you know, as we're entering this sort of new era of racial, not new, um, continuing era of racial democracy uh, in the U.S., uh, colorblindness, and Brazil, uh, in Brazil, sort of undermining that and, and, and implementing explicitly race-conscious remedies. You know, what can we learn from those strategies? And I think it's, the conversation is just beginning. We were only there for two weeks, and hopefully we'll get, uh, you know, more support to further this work. Um, on the question of the, the, the black faculty, um, I think one of the things we kind of brought out was the fact that there is, uh, there are black people who happen to be middle class, but there is not a black middle class. Right, so that means that there's a lack of black doctors, black lawyers, black faculty, and that's one of the things that really distinguishes our experience from their experience. So, you know, when we struggle here at UCLA or whatever campus, we tend to have at least one or two faculty members who we can work with, but they are the faculty. They are the first generation. They'll be the ones who will be helping, you know, the next, the next, and I think that's one of the major distinguishing factors because th there are none. I mean, to be as explicit as, as I could be. I mean, th there simply are none. You know, you get one or two, you know, but that's it. Thank you. I'm actually going to ask for a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> sure, you're all impressed as I am with the um, comparative work that we are trying to integrate into the critical race studies program here specifically and critical race theory as a field, I think, really strengthened by beginning to do more comparative work looking at CRT frameworks in international context. So uh, part of that story is how do you make international work possible for students in particular um, at a law school and we obviously would not have been able to do that without the support of our Dean's office here which provided some of the resources for the trip and we want to acknowledge him for that and we we'll acknowledge the Dean's office for that and we also want to acknowledge um, some people who went beyond the call of duty in Brazil Camila and I were here typing letters to make sure that you know our folks were going to be taking care of that and so I'm going to ask her to help me if I mispronounce some of these names but I do want to acknowledge the folks in Brazil that made this possible. Umberto Adami. Yes. Umberto, I got that one. That's from the I, uh, IARA. The Instituto. Oh, Institu Instituto de Advocacia Racial. Okay. Institute of uh, Racial Advocacy. That's <laughs> my translation of Brazilian, uh, Portuguese. Uh, Corina Mendes, Secretaria de Ciudad do Rio de Janeiro. Secretaria da Saúde da Cidade do Rio de Janeiro. All right. So we should have had her do this, but it's kind of fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> Edna <laughs> Roland. Yes. Edna Roland. Uh, Benedita da Silva. Joyce Aropao. Joyce Aropao. Aropao. You guys can help me too. Uh, João Jorge, Jorge, João Jorge, João Jorge, and the Sidina, the Sidina. So, go ahead. Okay, that's all Got right. it. Okay. All right. So, um, our commitment here as a program is to continue to work with the energy of our students to make these uh, comparative, uh, this comparative work possible, and to strengthen our program in that in that way. So um, I'd like to give you some instructions on what we're doing with the rest of our time here today. First of all, I just want to say it was very special for us in the program to have students that were willing to put on a full day of panels. And I want to ask for one more round of applause for the students of the CRS program. Thank you. I'm, I'm, um, I'm going to make a couple now. So did you want to? Just to run everyone, even if you have questions that weren't answered, we are on the web and the information in the back. So okay, that's right. See, we're online. Coming out of today, it's all going to happen online. This has been the student's vision. So definitely uh, we want to follow up on that recommendation. 
So um, this evening what we're going to do is move to uh, some of the faculty um, organized panels that are also a key part of this uh, conference. And if you look at your programs, what we're going to do now, I know some of you have been here since the morning and we want to really acknowledge you for, for being here for the first entire day. Um, we have a reception organized for the symposium and we're also going to do a special recognition of some of our alumni who've come back to be with us uh, for today and for this particular part of the program. We're going to do that in the courtyard. We have um, some food going. Some of you might have heard the saxophone in the background. We're going to do that for a little bit. Um, for about an hour and 15 minutes, if you look at your schedule, we'll be out in the courtyard. I'm going to ask you when you get ready to go out to eat, if you could go out the south side of the law school, the glass doors that are closest to that end of the school, go out towards past the podium, and there are going to be four lines that lead into where the grill is. You'll have some different uh, grilled options, both veggie and uh, meat options. And then uh, if you come with your food around this way, there are now tables set up for you. There are various tables that you can eat at, uh, at, during the program uh, that we're, we have planned at the courtyard. This evening um, at 6 p.m. we're going to have the symposium keynote address which is called Guantanamo is Here, Race, Rights and Citizenship. This is a um, keynote address that we've asked Professor Munir Ahmad of the American University to do. Really excited about his um, work connecting critical race frameworks to the war on terror and the specific racialization of Arabs, Middle Easterners, South Asians, Muslim Americans and others uh, impacted by the war on terror and the rest of us. At 6.30 p.m. we have our first um, UCLA faculty, CRS faculty moderated panel. That's uh, Professor Carbato is moderating a panel entitled The Construction of Racial Identities. It'll feature Dr. Howard Wynant, uh, Professor of Sociology from UC Santa Barbara, Professor Daria Rothmeyer, a Professor of Law from USC, and Professor Mari Matsuda, one of the founding voices of critical race theory, who's a Professor of Law at Georgetown. Tomorrow we'll start here again with um, Continental Breakfast and Registration at 8 and um, opening remarks at 8.30 and the first panel at 9 in the morning. So please join us outside in the courtyard for some dinner. Thank you.